This is the story of how steel went from being a rare, handcrafted alloy to a mass-produced material used in the machines, buildings, and infrastructure that shaped the industrial age. Steel is a truly amazing material. It can be made so hard that it cuts and shapes most known substances, including itself. It can be nearly as hard as diamond or so malleable that it can be cut, bent, hammered, rolled into sheets, or even drawn into ultra-thin wires. But even though it's made almost entirely of iron, you won't find steel ready-made in nature. Regular steel is an artificial material, an alloy of iron with a small amount of carbon, usually between 0.05% and 2.1%, depending on how hard you want it to be. It can also contain trace amounts of other elements like silicon, manganese, sulfur, and phosphorus, which are natural impurities in the metal and affect its quality. These are just a few of the details that show how difficult it is to produce. Even so, steel existed in small quantities long before any industrial process. And in a way, it was already a familiar material to ancient civilizations. The steel made by these early peoples was basically tempered iron. During smelting, the iron would absorb some carbon from the burning charcoal. Then it was shaped and forged, and while still red hot, plunged into cold water, which gave it the properties of steel. This process became known as tempering. A famous example is Damascus steel, known for its elegant and incredibly sharp blades. Made in the Middle East between the 3rd and 17th centuries, it was made from a type of steel called wootz, originally from India. Blades forged with the legendary Damascus steel were so well-tempered that, according to legend, they could slice a falling hair that touched the blade, or even cut another blade in half. But the secret to producing this medieval steel was eventually lost over time, turning into a mystery for centuries. Today, steelmakers and metallurgists have developed modern versions of the alloy, like this one, that come very close to the ancient blades. Despite these wonders, the big problem with ancient steel was its production. It was expensive, time-consuming, and impossible to do on a large scale. That limited its use to tools, weapons, and special items. The easier and cheaper alternative was cast iron, even though it was heavier, more fragile, and brittle. Still, it came with its own set of challenges, Producing it required very high temperatures, something that only became possible in Europe starting in the 14th century, thanks to advances in furnace technology. The introduction of the blast furnace greatly boosted production, but the main challenge remained. The hardest part of making iron and steel was removing impurities. Iron ore is usually full of unwanted substances that, if not removed, make the metal almost useless. Steel used to make things like railroad tracks, for example, had to withstand huge amounts of stress without breaking and that was only possible if it was free of impurities. That's why removing them has always been such a serious problem. In the blast furnace, a certain amount of limestone was added to the coal and iron ore. When the ore melted under intense heat, the impurities in the iron combined with the limestone to form what's known as slag. Since molten iron is heavier, it sank to the bottom of the furnace while the slag floated to the top and was removed. This process removed most of the impurities and produced a raw form of iron with a high carbon content known as pig iron. With around 5% carbon, pig iron is still the starting point for making both cast iron and steel, which needs to have less than 2.1% carbon. But precisely controlling that carbon ratio was a difficult and expensive task until the 19th century. Starting around 1760, the Industrial Revolution, with its steam engines, railways, bridges, and other massive structures, created a growing demand for a metal stronger than cast iron or hand-forged iron. That demand began to be met with the use of the cementation process, which produced what was known as blister steel in cities like Sheffield, England. In the cementation process, bars of wrought iron were packed in powdered charcoal and heated for several days in completely sealed furnaces. Since it was an almost pure metal with less than 0.1% carbon, wrought iron allowed the carbon content to be increased, the opposite of what modern steelmaking does. During this prolonged heating, the carbon from the charcoal slowly penetrated the iron layer by layer, gradually turning the surface into blister steel, a type of steel that was harder and stronger than the original iron, but not to the point of becoming brittle, since the more carbon you add, the harder and more fragile the metal gets. This method made it possible to produce higher quality steel in much greater quantities than earlier techniques, and it was especially useful for blades and tools. But, and there's always a but, the long production time and the need for that nearly pure, low-carbon iron were some of the bottlenecks that kept the cost of steel extremely high. Everything changed in the 1850s with the invention of the Bessemer process, 
Henry Bessemer, born in England in 1813, is the person we can credit with the birth of modern steel. But here's a side note. In the United States, some claim the process was independently invented, around the same time, by William Kelly. That point is still debated to this day. Either way, the Bessemer process, patented in 1856, was both clever and revolutionary. It involved pouring molten iron into a container with holes at the bottom and blowing high-pressure air through those holes to remove impurities and excess carbon. The stream of air kept the liquid metal from flowing through the holes, and as it passed through the molten iron, it oxidized the carbon, removing it from the mix and releasing enough heat to keep the metal molten. Then, the exact amount of carbon was added back in, allowing the properties of the steel to be adjusted for its intended use. The process was faster, cheaper, and far more efficient than anything that came before, making it possible to produce high-quality steel on a large scale. Before the invention of the Bessemer process, Britain's annual production of cast steel was only about 50,000 tons, with an average cost ranging from 50 pounds to 600 pounds per ton, a prohibitive price for many of the uses we take for granted today. With the introduction of the new process, British production jumped to 750,000 tons by 1877, 15 times more than what the previous method could deliver. The average price dropped to just 10 pounds per ton, and coal savings reached 3.5 million tons compared to what would have been needed using the old cementation process in Sheffield. It's estimated that the total cost savings amounted to roughly 30 million pounds in that single year of 1877. It was with the Bessemer process that the visionary Andrew Carnegie founded Carnegie Steel in 1892, one of the 10 major companies acquired by banker J.P. Morgan in 1901 to form U.S. Steel, the largest capital consolidation the world had seen up to that point. Its capital of $1.4 billion at the time was equal to half of all the money in circulation in the United States, making it the first company in the world to surpass $1 billion in market value. In its first full year of operation, in 1902, the company produced 67% of all American steel. By that decade, its assets included 149 steel plants with an annual capacity of 9 million tons, 18,000 coke ovens, over 100,000 acres of land, 125 lake vessels, and several small railroads. The company employed more than 150,000 workers, who were paid over $120 million in wages each year. As for the Bessemer process, it was revolutionary and remained in use until the late 1960s, but it had its limitations. It didn't work well with certain types of iron ore, especially those high in phosphorus, which made it harder to control the quality of the steel. To overcome these and other challenges, the Siemens-Martin process, also known as the open hearth process, began to be adopted. It was developed around 1850, at about the same time as the Bessemer process, by William Siemens in England and Pierre-Emile Martin in France. Although slower, this method allowed for much more precise control over the steel's composition, resulting in a higher quality product. By using roughly 50% scrap metal in the process, it helped lower production costs while recycling material that would otherwise go to waste. An open hearth furnace consists of what might be termed an upstairs and a downstairs. Upstairs is the hearth in which the steel making materials are refined. Downstairs are heating chambers containing fire brick laid in checkerboard pattern. One chamber for heating the fuel, which may be oil, gas, or oil and tar, and another chamber for heating air. The preheated air and fuel move upward, pass into the space above the hearth. Combustion instantly takes place. Currents of flaming fuel sweep over the hot metal, creating temperatures as high as 3,000 degrees. Excess carbon and impurities are burned out. The hot exhaust gases pass down through another set of checker chambers, heating the bricks as they pass between them. Every 15 minutes, the direction of flow of the fuel and air is reversed. In this way, air and gas are heated in one set of chambers while hot exhaust gases are heating the others. This operation continues for nine to 12 hours. And the wheel of progress kept turning. New methods emerged, like the linz donowitz process, which could convert 400 tons of pig iron and scrap into steel in just 40 minutes, a task that used to take nine to 12 hours with the previous method. Electric arc furnaces also came into play with an operating time of around one hour. 
Once mass production became possible in the 1850s, steel became the backbone of the industrial age and the modern world. It was used in just about everything. The expansion of railroads, the construction of bridges that had once been technologically impossible, the framework of buildings that gave rise to skyscrapers, the building of larger and more durable ships, and more powerful weapons. Simply put, the world as we know it wouldn't exist without steel. Since then, steel has become one of the most widely used materials in the world, to the point that its production is often seen as a barometer of a country's economic health. Today, there are countless specialized types of steel created by combining it with other elements for uses ranging from lighter, safer cars to airplanes, and even advances in medicine through precision surgical instruments. Fortunately, Mother Nature has been generous. We still have vast reserves of iron and coal, along with a massive supply of scrap metal ready to be reused, ensuring raw materials for a good while. 